I know that uh, probably everybody that's here is going to be with other uh, extended family members on Thursday. If you are, raise your hand. Extended family members. Okay, praise the Lord. How many have any concern about that gathering that you're going to have? Anybody? Any concern about any conversations that may come up or discussions that may come up or... Okay, there's one. It would be pretty rare to have a room full of church that wouldn't have some kind of an issue coming up, <laughs> I think. And so before we go any further, I would just like us to all agree in prayer. I'm going to pray that everybody's family gathering for Thanksgiving is really, truly a day of Thanksgiving. Amen. Really, truly a day of joy, of being with each other. Some haven't been with each other for a long time. Some have been just yesterday were with family. But So let me pray first of all for that. Father, I just thank you for this Thursday that's coming for in our country, this Thanksgiving Thursday. A day of thanksgiving, Lord. Father, I, in church I can't help but think of my daughter Sandra who lost her husband this, this summer. And she told me that she was going to make sure that when she had his family over for Thanksgiving, which would be on a different day, there would be laughter and there would be joy. There would not be tears and sadness because Bob wasn't there. There would be memories of all the wonderful times she had, and she was just thanking God for the time she had with him, and that he was a part of her life for those years. And I thought, how mature is that? That's wonderful. And so I just blessed her and prayed for her. Father, help us all to be filled with joy of what you have given us. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning. Good morning. It's a good, beautiful day. We haven't blown away yet. Right? <laughs> that wind was blowing this morning. Unbelievable. We have a huge, well, we sit in a bunch of trees, but we have one huge big tree. It's got to be about 100 years old. And even that was <laughs> rocking a bit, just a bit in the wind. And I thought, oh, I don't want that to go over. Because <laughs> it's going to go over on our house if it goes over. So... Welcome to Sunday morning meeting at Cornerstone Church, Walker, Minnesota, USA. We're a Bible-based church. We preach the full gospel of God. We preach the good news of Jesus Christ Amen. and following the Holy Spirit to the yes. best of our ability. Amen. Make sure you have your Bible, you who are with us uh, by video, your Bible, a pen, and a paper for notes. I think everybody would agree our, our Bible. Our country is a terrible place today. Yeah. We are in the middle of one of the worst messes we have ever been in. However, in many ways, it's also one of the most exciting times we've had in recent years because there's so much anticipation for what God is going to do. And I believe that God is going to do something. Yeah. There is going to be something that we will come out of this and go, that was amazing what God just did. That was amazing. We seek God's hand for direction. We seek God's hand for guidance. We know that he's the supreme God above all things. And this mess we are in has not caught him by surprise. He knew it was coming all along. And he is in it. What do I mean by that? He didn't cause it. But his hand is on it. His hand is on us. His hand is on this church. Praise the Lord for that. I had something marked here just a minute ago, um, and I want to read it. The Lord has just given me this scripture. In Jeremiah 29, verse, starting with verse 11. I believe this is God's word to us. Has been for quite a while, but now refreshed and renewed. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah, because he doesn't want bad things for us. He has good things planned for us. Plans for welfare and not for calamity. To give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. 
and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. In Jeremiah 29, starting at verse 11. Praise the Lord. On Wednesday nights, we have, at 6 o'clock, we meet here as we study the last days in Revelation, as per Jesus Christ. The revelation of the victorious Jesus Christ. And you who are listening to us now are welcome to join us. Every, it is open to anybody. Praise the Lord. The message this morning, you'll be surprised since we're coming up on Thanksgiving. And Thanksgiving is all about what? Thankfulness. Thankfulness. All about Thanksgiving. And I think sometimes we forget that. We just make food, more food than anybody needs in their right mind. As we consider this day of Thanksgiving that's approaching, let's consider what that means. A day of Thanksgiving. A day of Thanksgiving. Or a week of Thanksgiving beforehand. But so many people, it's just a day of Thanksgiving. Some people, it's not even a day of Thanksgiving. It's just a day to have a turkey or a ham or whatever in the world you have and get together with family or friends. Family and family or friends. Now let's put that different. Family and friends. Yeah. Not family or friends. Hopefully our family are our friends. <laughs> what are we thankful for? That's a question. We need to ask each one of us. And so I'm asking you now, what are you thankful for this Thanksgiving? Just shout it out. Jesus. Jesus. Family. What else? Family. Family. Help. Help. Yeah. Answered prayer. Answered prayer. Yeah. And the roof that doesn't blow away in the wind. What? The roof that doesn't blow away in the wind. Yes. We have the wind. Anything else? Electricity. E what? Electricity. Electricity. All right. Vision. Vision. Provision. Provision. Grandchildren. Is, it, is that as in positive vision? What is it? <laughs> provision. He provides. Oh, provision. Vision Not provision. Well. Okay. <laughs> provision. Okay. All right. Okay. Who, who else said something? <coughs> something. Grandkids. 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 They are wonderful. They're almost more the wonderful than your children. How about great grandkids? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Not yet. <laughs> Please, not yet. <laughs> so, think carefully. I would suggest to you that if you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, and you've heard the good news of salvation through Jesus, that to be thankful for Jesus Christ would be a big one. Amen. Yes. Amen. The true foundation of Christian life is Jesus Christ himself. Nothing else. No one else. There is nothing else. It's all about him. There's no one else. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11. For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. There's no foundation that we can put under this church that is better than Jesus Christ. There's no foundation that we can put in our lives that is more superior to Jesus Christ. We need Jesus Christ. Yeah. Yeah. If we don't know Jesus Christ, then we don't know why. So the key is to come to know Jesus Christ. How then does a person build upon the rock, which is Christ? Let's look back to that dramatic moment when Christ and Peter stood face to face in Matthew 16, verses 15 and 16. Matthew 16, verses 15 and 16. And he said to his disciples, but who do you say I am? So let me ask you now, and you out there, who do you say he is? He's the Christ, the Savior. Yes. Anything else? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, in verse 17, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. So where did Peter get the understanding? From God. From God. How did he do that? How did God do that? Through the Holy Spirit. Through the Holy Spirit. He got a revelation directly from God through the Holy Spirit. 
And also I say to you that you are Peter. Upon the rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not overpower it. You know, there is, in Christ's words to him, which most of us probably are familiar with, in Greek, there's a, there, if there is in Christ's answer to Peter a deliberate play upon words, he, he used a little, he moved things around a little bit, and he said, in Greek, the name Peter is Petros. What does Petros mean? Pebble. What? Pebble. Pebble. Small stone. And on this rock, Petra, I will build my church. What does the word rock mean? What does Petra mean? Stone. What? Stone. It means a large stone. So Peter was a small stone, the word, the word for in Greek. But the rock is a big stone. In other words, Peter, you, you know, you're just small. You're just little. You're, you're nothing compared to the rock of Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. the foundation. There is a similarity in sound between these two words and their meaning, but their meaning is quite different. The idea of building a church upon a pebble would be obviously ridiculous. He's not identifying Peter with the rock, like some have taught over the years that it was Peter who was the rock. But that was not what, what Jesus was saying. On the contrary, he's con contrasting Peter with the rock. He's just little. Peter is insignificant compared to the rock who is Jesus Christ. He's pointing out how small and insignificant that little stone is, Peter, is in comparison to the great rock upon which the church is built. And the great rock upon which the church is built is who? Christ. Jesus Christ. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's my Savior. That's my Redeemer. That's the one that came to me and met me and touched me and healed me and called me. Christ is the rock. Peter had a definite personal experience. There are four, there were four successive stages in this experience. Let's look at that for just a minute. Number one, he had a direct personal confrontation of Peter by Christ. Can you would you like to have that confrontation? Would you like Peter to or Christ to speak to you directly? That's a confront that's a confrontation. That's that's Peter coming and speaking to you. You cannot miss it. Like the young man in Africa that I talked about a few weeks ago. This was years and years ago, and he was now a pastor of a church when I met him. And I, I asked him, how did you come to know Jesus? He was very poor, just lived in a little village. And, and he said he was riding his bicycle on the road at night, and it was dark. And he didn't have such a thing as a flashlight. When all of a sudden, a light appeared before him. The whole road was lit up in front of him. And he heard a voice say, I am Christ. The light of this world. I said, really? Did you really hear that? Yes, yes, Mom, I did, he said. He got all excited all again. I said, what happened? He said, well, I fell off my bike. <laughs> <laughs> well, I suppose I would do. I said, then what'd you do? Well, he said, I laid there for a while. He said, I just was like I was frozen. I, I couldn't believe what I saw and what I heard. And he said, I closed my eyes twice like this. Just blinked real hard, and when I opened my eyes, it was gone. The light was gone. The voice was gone. And I got up, and I got on my bike, and I turned around, and I went back home as fast as I could. And he said, and Mom Don, I've never been the same. Yeah. How could you? How could you be the same when you meet the living God? Yeah. Amazing. There's no mediator. There was no mediator between Christ and Peter. There was no mediator between... Christ and that little African boy. I guess my dad a man. Um, <clears throat> no other human being played any part at all in either one of those experiences. It was just all about God. He's real. He's a part of this world. A direct personal revelation granted to Peter 
Jesus said to Peter in Matthew 16, 17, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. This is not an outcome of some natural uh, reasoning or intellectual understanding. It was the outcome of a direct spiritual revelation to Peter by God, the Father himself. Number three, personal acknowledgement by Peter of the truth that had been revealed to him, just like the man that I talked to that fell off the bike. And open, number four, an open and public confession by Peter of the truth that he acknowledged. In these four successive stages, we see what it means to build upon the rock. There is nothing abstract, nothing intellectual or theoretical about the whole thing. Each state involves a definite individual experience. How many have had those, had that experience at least one time? Just one time. You're never the same after that. And if you haven't had that experience, that encounter, personal encounter with God, ask God to meet you there. The third stage is a personal acknowledgement of Christ. The fourth stage is an open and personal confession of Christ. Through these four experiences, Christ becomes for each individual believer the rock upon which faith is built. And when it's built upon that rock, it, it cannot be moved. It will never be moved. It's that solid. The answer, the question is, can a person today come to know Christ in the same direct, personal way that Peter did? I'm asking you, can a person today yes. have that same experience? Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Yeah. He is unchanging. He's the same. First, it was not Christ in his purely human nature who was revealed to Peter. Peter, Peter already knew Jesus of Nazareth, the carpenter's son. The one who, now re, who was now revealed to Peter was the divine, eternal, unchanging son of God. This is the same Christ we know who now lives exalted in heaven at the Father's right hand. It's the same Christ that I met on a lonely country road, I think in 1983, I lost track, 1984 maybe. It's the same Jesus. It was the same vic victorious way, the same life, the same power, and the same voice. In the passage of 2,000 years, there has been no change in him at all. He's still Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He was revealed to Peter. He can still be revealed today to those who sincerely seek him. What's the key? Sincerely seeking him. The revelation did not come by flesh and blood, but by any, or by any physical or sensory means. It was a spiritual revelation, the work of the Holy Spirit. The same Spirit who gave this revelation to Peter is still at work in all the world, revealing the same Christ. Jesus himself promised his disciples in John 16, verses 13 and 14. But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will disclose to you what is to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall take of mine, and he will disclose it to you. Can you imagine? Can you imagine that Jesus Christ will disclose to you, to me, to you, what is to come? Would you like to know what is to come tomorrow, or next year, or 10 years from now? Would you like to know? And how can we find out? Only if Jesus Christ reveals it. And he can reveal it. He can tell it. Where could we learn today about what's going to happen tomorrow? I don't mean physically tomorrow, but tomorrow in the future. Where could we learn it today? In our Bibles. In our Bibles. Where? In the book of Revelation. Because the book of Revelation is a revelation of what? Jesus of Jesus Christ. 
you learn more about Jesus Christ in the book of Revelation than you learn, I think, than you learn through the whole Bible. You, what you learn about Jesus Christ in the book of Revelation is how victorious he is. Amen. He is not the suffering servant that he was in the four Gospels. He's not the one that's being beaten and, and, and crucified and mm -hmm. bloody. He is the victor, victorious man. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. It's amazing. The Apostle Paul did not say, I know what I have believed. Mm -hmm. What did he say? What did the Apostle Paul say? In whom I have believed. I know whom I have believed. His faith was not founded upon a creed. It wasn't founded on a particular church. It was founded upon Jesus Christ. But upon a person whom he knew by direct acquaintance with Christ, he had a serene confidence concerning the well-being of his soul, which nothing in time or eternity could ever change. That's what we have in Jesus Christ. Suppose I were to put a simple question to you. Are you a Christian? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Sir. Yes. <laughs> what kind of an answer would you be able to give? Psalm 100, verses 4 and 5. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His loving kindness is everlasting and his faithfulness is to all generations. Anyone. Yeah. Have you ever heard the phrase? Some here have heard quite often. No good deed goes unpunished. <laughs> Sadly, this, this often is a true statement. The reason this is too often true is because those who who the good deed is bestowed upon are unthankful. Are you with me? Unthankfulness. Now there's a word for you. Unthankfulness. Second Timothy 3, verses 1 and 2. But realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. Are we in the last days? Yes. yes. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, <coughs> arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy. What does the word ungrateful mean? Unthankful. No thankfulness. Here the great apostle Paul is writing to his son in the gospel, gospel Timothy. In chapter 3, Paul warns Timothy that in the last days there would come a spirit into the world that would cause much trouble for the church. Can anybody say amen? amen. That spirit is alive and well mm -hmm. in the church today. Broad statement. Mm -hmm. yeah. That spirit. Are you still wondering if we're living in the last days? No. No. Here's a verse. Here in verse 2 he tells Timothy that among the lovers of themselves, <laughs> lovers of money, boastful, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents and unholy would be people who are unthankful. One may never expect that unthankful people would receive such a harsh judgment. Doesn't seem like such a big deal, does it? Unthankfulness? Doesn't seem like such a big deal. And unless you think about it, it doesn't even seem like a sin. It's so common. People just assume that people will do things for them. Why put it right before unholy in verse 2? Right before unholy. Ungrateful, unholy. Hebrews 12, 14 says, Pursue peace with all men and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. So if a lack of holiness would keep one from seeing the Lord, what would be the result of being unthankful? Now you need to think about this a little bit. Don't just let it go over your head. What would be the result of being unthankful if unholiness would stop you from seeing the Lord? And that's the last word that was in that paragraph. Unthankful. One thing is true in every circle, and that is 
that not everyone appreciates all you do for them. That's right. There should have been more amens than that. <laughs> no matter how hard you try to please some people, they are never going to completely appreciate what you've done. That's a sad thing, isn't it? Or at least the effort that you that you put into doing something for them. Not even the effort. There are some people in this world and even in the church who are simply unthankful people. I have heard people pray for the food, for their food and say, quote, for these gifts we ask that you make us truly thankful. You have to ask God to make you thankful? That doesn't seem to make sense. If they only knew what they were saying when they say that. Being thankful, it's not a natural state of mind for most people. Being thankful comes from knowing want. Anybody here ever know what I mean, want? Yeah. Not very many raise their hand. Say that again. Anybody here ever known any want? You ever short of anything? Food, money, clothing, anything, no. heat, yeah. loneliness. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Being thankful no, comes from knowing want, having lived without or gone without. It comes from not having, period. A woman will be thankful for the husband she has when she understands what it means to not have a good husband. Mm -hmm. A husband on this, a reversing will understand what it means to have, will be thankful for having a good wife when he figures out that maybe he could have had a bad wife. And what is a bad wife or a bad husband? A man will be thankful for a job he has when he has gone through a long period of time without a job. See, because of not having a job, he becomes thankful when he has his job. Thank you, Lord. That's right. If you thanks the right person. Being sick teaches you how to be thankful for painless days. Yes. Right. Amen. <laughs> I don't know, a lot of amens on that. Yes. Near death sickness teaches you how to be thankful for each and every day. Yes. Yes. When I nearly died in Kenya in the hospital, the doctor said I was a half an hour from death when I got to the hospital. As I laid there and for that week that I was there, or however many days I was there, I begin to think about those kind of things. Praise the Lord, I did not die. That would have still been a good thing. I would have gone to be with the Lord, but you know what I mean. I wasn't ready. I'm sorry. I wasn't ready in my mind to accept that. Mm -hmm. I was ready. I knew where I would go. Being broke teaches you how to be thankful. Amen. Being lonely teaches you how to be thankful for someone who goes out of their way to be your friend. Have you ever needed a friend and you didn't see you feel like you had a friend and then you found a friend who was really a friend? Were you thankful for that friend? Thankful people are usually the people who've been down the road of adversity. They are people who know what it means to struggle. They are people who have not had the world handed to them on a silver platter. I can see a lot of silver platters in here. <laughs> I'm sure there are some silver platters out there, but probably not very many. They worked hard to get where they're at. They endured much expense and labor to reach a certain place. They did all they could, and when they failed, they prayed to Jesus, and then they knew where their help came from when it was delivered. Amen. The Bible sets on thankful people apart from thankful people. It lets us know that to be unthankful is a sin, a grievous sin, as it should be. When someone does something for you, you the response of your heart on your lips should be, thank you. Amen. Amen. It's God, your next door neighbor, someone in the church, or even a complete stranger. When someone gives you something that belongs to them, time, just time, it's their time, but they give it to you. Money, prayer, love, the response should be, thank you. Thankful. Mm -hmm. 
And our thing should always be directed to the Lord. Amen. Amen. Ephesians 5.20. Always giving thanks for all things. Always giving thanks for all things. I lost it. Move the page. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to God, even the Father. Without the thankfulness, we almost assuredly hinder the workings of the Holy Spirit in our lives. I never thought about that before. But if we are not thankful and verbally thankful, and prayerfully thankful, we hinder the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Luke 17, Luke 17, starting with verse 12 through to 19. And as he entered a certain village, ten leprous men who stood at a distance met him. And they raised their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And it came about that as they were going, they were cleansed. Now one of them, when he saw that he had been healed, turned back, glorifying God with a loud voice. And he fell on his face at his feet, giving thanks to him. And he was a Samaritan. He was a foreigner. He wasn't even a Jew. That's why it says at the end, he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed? But the nine, where are they? Was no one found who turned back to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, to the foreigner, Rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. That's quite a story when you think about it. Mm -hmm. Because it's through thankfulness that he's healed. What an amazing miracle. What an amazing testimony. Leprosy of that day was thought to be disease that came from extreme filth. Leprous people were not even allowed to walk on the same side of the street with everyone else. It was a terrible thing. When they walked into towns or around other people, they had to holler out, Unclean! Unclean! So that nobody would come near them. They would warn everybody. Can you imagine the social stigma that was on the leper, the lepers? They were unable to even be around their families. They had to watch their families grow up, their children, from a distance. They lived in colonies of other leprous people. They were surrounded every day with the sickness of others and the stench of their own disease. So these ten men cried out to Jesus for their healing, and he healed them. He wasn't in a hurry to go show himself to the priest, the, the one, the tenth one. So he could be admitted back into society with his family. Look at this with me in Luke 17, 15 and 16. Now one of them, when he saw that he had been healed, turned back and glorified God with a loud voice. And he fell on his face at his feet, giving thanks to him. And he was a Samaritan, a foreigner. Wow. The nine went on their way. They just kept going. They were unthankful. Jesus noticed a distinct difference between this man and the other nine. Luke 17, 17, 19 says, And Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed? But the nine, where are they? Has no one found, was, was no one found who turned back to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Rise and go on your way, your faith has made you well. Jesus asked the question, where are the other nine? Mm -hmm. Ten were cleansed, but only one is thankful. What happened to the other nine? Jesus made mention of the fact that some people appreciate when something good is done to them, and some don't. In fact, the percentage of unthankful people in this account of Jesus' ministry is alarming. The unthankful ones were 90% of the people were unthankful, but praise God for the 10%. Amen. Thank God for the few that came back and said to say thank you, the one. If it wasn't for them, I wonder what would happen. I wonder if churches and pastors and good people and even the Lord himself would continue doing good to others if it weren't for the few that say thank you. What that do come back 
They say, thank you. And you, even now, every now and then, someone says, I really do appreciate your help. You have no idea how much your help means to me right now. Thankful people. What a blessing they are. Mm -hmm. Look what Jesus did for the thankful man that he didn't do for the other nine men who scurried off in a hurry to get out of all their lives. Luke 17, 19, and he said to him, Rise and go your way, your faith has made you well. In the New King James it says, Your faith has made you whole. <coughs> well or whole means to save, means salvation. The man was expressing thankfulness, but Jesus accounted it to him for faith. That's powerful. People say all the time, give me more faith. Give me more faith, God. Maybe we should be more thankful. Mm. Marcy and I are blessed. We had an opportunity, more than one opportunity, to minister in leprosy camps in India. It was quite the experience. People missing fingers, toes, and maybe even feet. And we had the opportunity to be there and minister to them. It was quite an experience. They even had a pet dog in one of the camps who only had three legs. The dog fit perfectly into the camp. And they were so joyful yes. in the couple of camps that we yes. ministered in. They sang and worshiped and laughed and smiled. <coughs> it was amazing. There were a couple of places as we walked down the street at the house, the house was the little houses and camps and tents where we couldn't go into the house because people were very sick there. But they, they were singing from inside because they were so joyful that we were there. They were so joyful and every one of them they, that they told us knew Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. As many of you know, leprosy causes flesh to die off on its, on its victim's body, so literally fingers and toes and extremities fall off. As well, they lose the ability to feel any pain, which causes them to do great harm to themselves because they don't feel if they cut themselves. There's a difference between being healed of leprosy and being made whole. Yeah as a thankful yeah. man was. Many Bible scholars believe that the original nine men went, went away <coughs> healed of leprosy because it would be sort of a good job, but still carrying the scars of their sickness mm -hmm. and its devastation to their bodies. Yeah. On the other hand, the thankful man left that day not only healed of the terrible disease, but he was also made whole. Yeah. In other words, the Lord restored what the sickness stole from him. This could mean even more than his body being restored to its original state, but also his relationships with other people like his family, and even his place of status within the community. However you look at it, Jesus did something more for the thankful man than he did for the nine. Here's why our worship is so important. It's showing our thankfulness for his love for us and what he has done for our lives. It brings into our lives that reward the Bible talks about, the extra blessing, the added bonus, the thing that not everybody else gets. Why don't you think about what you have to be thankful for today? Yeah. Why not make a list of the things the Lord has brought you through and tell him one more time, thank you, Lord. Thank you that you came to my rescue in those times. Thank you, Lord, that you were there when, when terrible things were happening to me. You were there and protected me. I did not die. I lived. Thank you, Lord. Tell him one more time. Thank you. Why not lift our hands and yield ourselves to him with thanksgiving today? Psalm 62, verses 1 and 2. My soul waits in silence for God only. From him is my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation, my stronghold. I shall not be greatly shaken. There is nothing that can shake me because of Jesus Christ and what he has done. Psalm 62, verses 5 through 7. My soul, wait in silence for God only, for my hope is from him. 
He only is my rock and my salvation, my stronghold. I shall not be shaken. On God, my salvation, my glory rests, the rock of my strength, the refuge. My refuge is in God. One final word from Job as we approach Thanksgiving Day. Job 22, verse 21 and 23. Yield yourselves now and be at peace with him, thereby goodwill come to you. Please receive instruction from his mouth and establish his words in your heart. If you return to the Almighty, you will be restored. We serve a mighty God. We need to remember our thankfulness, God. Thankfulness gives us that extra gift that the unthankful do not receive. They might be healed, but will they be whole? God bless you. Let's close in prayer. Father, I thank you. There's no, there are no words that really adequately express our thankfulness to you for all that you've done in each of our lives. I don't know each person here personally. I don't know each person that's listening personally. But I do know this. As a Christian or as a seeker, you have gone through hard times, difficult times. I also feel that there's someone who has had a great loss. And you're struggling to find how to get over that loss. And I would suggest to you that you'll, you'll never get over the loss. But God will take you through it. He will hold you up. He will wipe away every tear. And he will show you the times, the places to look upon and be thankful for. So, Father, we give you this day. We pray most of all that you be glorified in all things. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let's close in prayer. Join us for a bit of fellowship. God bless you.